Well, I have to say, as we are just beginning this um, webinar, that it is always striking for me to begin this kind of uh, joint Israeli event with a, a UAE think tank, I should say joint Israeli Emirati uh, event, uh, connecting the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and of course the uh, Emirates Policy Center. I would like to welcome in the very beginning, Dr. Ebtisam El Ketbi, who is the president of the Emirates Policy Center uh, in Abu Dhabi. I also would like to thank our own Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser, who conceived this conference. Uh, Cooper, for those of you who don't know, uh, served as the uh, head of assessment of IDF military intelligence and later as director general of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. He'll be moderating later sessions. But first, let us begin with uh, Dr. El Ketbi. And uh, I will turn over the floor to her. Thank you. Thanks for uh, the invitation and for this joint uh, conference we are having. I'm truly uh, excited. And I think we are discussing uh, a timely and highlighting the issue, which is, I think needs to be uh, discussed and explained and why it took all these long time, we could not achieve anything through negotiation or through other uh, uh, tools. Thank you. Well, this webinar is about the growing Iranian threat to regional and Western security. Now you might wonder, a growing threat? This was not supposed to happen. Iran was under the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, a document that was concluded by the P5 plus one on July 14th, 2015. It should have reduced the scale of the Iranian threat to the Middle East and beyond. Instead, it did just the opposite. When I started my work on Middle Eastern security, I was Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, and we focused in 1991 on weapons of mass destruction, not of Iran, but of Saddam Hussein's Iraq. To recall, the elimination of Iraqi WMD was based on UN Security Council Resolution 687, which also served as the basis of the ceasefire in the first Gulf War. That resolution prohibited Iraq from possessing biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons. It also banned all missiles with a range greater than 150 kilometers. A new UN organization called UNSCOM inspected suspected sites for banned Iraqi missiles. Most of the tricks that Iran would use years later were already tried out by Iraq. For that reason, it was striking to me that when the P5 plus one completed the JCPOA in 2015, there was no stipulation limiting Iran's possession or deployment of missiles of any range. It was left out of the accord. It was one of several glaring faults in the negotiating record of the Iran deal, like its weak inspection system that only opened up declared Iranian sites to regular inspections. The Western powers uncovered Iranian nuclear infrastructure in undeclared sites like Natanz, Isfahan, and Fordu. Then there were the sunset clauses that allow key provisions to expire. It struck me that the JCPOA was like a carton of milk that had an expiration date. It wasn't intended to last forever. These flaws all interacted with each other. So after 10 years, let's say, 
when the limitations on uranium enrichment are removed and Iran can manufacture as much weapons grade uranium as it wants, it will have already built up a huge stock of long range ballistic missiles. If you put together the enriched uranium and the missiles, you get a new Soviet Union a mini superpower run by radical ayatollahs and not by godless communists. Last, there is the issue of the removal of sanctions on the Iranian economy and its influence on what we call Iran's malign activities. A study this year by the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change demonstrated convincingly that the assumption that the conclusion of the JCPOA would moderate Iran's malign activities was completely wrong. The number of Iranian-backed militias in the Middle East actually surged after 2015 and entered new theaters like Africa, Morocco, and the Western Sahara. Since the 1971 Islamic Revolution, Iran has viewed large parts of the Arab world as its rightful patrimony. It sees Bahrain as Iranian sovereign territory. It's impossible to imagine Iran withdrawing from the three islands near the Strait of Hormuz that belong to the United Arab Emirates. I cannot imagine Tehran conceding the Shia populated sections of Iraq. The same is beginning to happen in Syria. In short, the removal of sanctions while Iran is still pursuing the export of the Islamic revolution and voicing these territorial claims will inevitably leave the Middle East with a new spike in terror and insurgency operations from Syria in the north to Yemen in the south as well as a new wave of Iranian expansionism well beyond. Dr. el if you would like to say a few more words about how it looks from the point of view of the United Arab Emirates, we should highly appreciate that. Thank you. May I would say more than a few words? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not an exaggeration to say that Iran pursuit of regional hegemony has come to represent an increasingly uh, complicated and intractable dilemma. Uh, Iran has neither succeeded in its aims nor abandoned this destructive strategy. For four decades, it has uh, threatened the security and stability of the region and, and the Gulf in particular. Uh, as, as Dori said, creating an impasse that now extends beyond the Middle East to affect global interest. Major uh, political, economic, and social trends in Iran indicate that more severe consequences will follow if the international community does not find a way to solve this problem and bring, an, uh, and bring Iran back into its orbit. This perspective is based on the growing uh, aspiration of political forces uh, inside Iran that are set to add a new levels of complexity to the situation. Uh, the, the coming few years will be crucial if the international community does not succeed in, in resolving the, the dilemma. The Iranian crisis will become ever more bleak. Uh, as far as the nuclear issues is concerned, Tehran's announcement that it has started uranium enrichment at current level 60% proves that Iran is very close to become a nuclear threshold state as uh, acquiring a nuclear bomb will only require a political decision by the Iranian regime. The critical catalyst for, for the Iranian regime to go to this direction is that the fact the international community does not have 
or has failed to show that it can develop an alternative plan in case the negotiations on the return to the uh, 2015 nuclear deal with, with Tehran fails. Now, if, you, if we ask, why did international approaches fail? A, a modest and increasingly international sense of the need to find a solution to Iran impasse as soon as possible, several attempts have been made from the GCPOA in which world power uh, acquiesces to separate the nuclear issue from that of Iran regional inter interference to the maximum pressure uh, campaign implemented by Trump administration to tamp the Iranian regime. However, all these uh, efforts have failed to tamp or rehabilitate the Iranian regime because all of these uh, efforts have ignored the strategic determinants related to, to Tehran hegemonic project and the nature of the political regime leading this project. What is worse, Tehran has exploited the West focus on uh, its nuclear program to extend its regional influence and develop its missile program. The failure of the nuclear deal reflects its neglect of the strategic determinants that governs Iran's perception of uh, itself and the world around it as a country with imperialistic and, and uh, doctrinal motivations. It was also over uh, optimistic in its estimation of Tehran desire to reach cooperative regional solution. Meanwhile, by reducing uh, Iran's policy motivation to simple economy, the maximum pressure campaign employed by Trump administration for the past three years also uh, failed to accomplish its key aims, the Iranian regime has not been moved from its position on a range of uh, contentious issues despite the economic pressure the country has suffered. So regional approaches to solve Iranian impasse have also not taken into account the duplicity of the ruling regime in Tehran, nor the nature uh, of relation between the government and the deep state, uh, rendering them hollow, superficial, and based on proposal for pacification and, and good will only. International initiatives have also shown inability to understand the ideological, psychological, and historical uh, factors uh, surrounding Iran issues. And I will stop there. Thank you. Definitely uh, sounds very strong uh, to hear it from our friends in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, we shall move from here uh, to the first session that uh, deals with the uh, Iran's nuclear challenge and the continued development of Iranian missiles. And our first speaker in, uh, in that session will be uh, Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is today a distinguished fellow at the Smith Stimson Center, but he was uh, also uh, the uh, deputy uh, director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the uh, head of its department of safeguards. So the, Dr. Heinonen was deeply involved in uh, the inspections of uh, Iranian uh, nuclear activities. And uh, I would like to hear your opinion about whether uh, it is at all possible to return to the JCPOA and what should be done to prevent Iran from having a military nuclear capability in the situation that we are in today. Please. Well, thank you for having me. And I try to fulfill your requirements. As we know, this week, uh, the JCPOA parties meet in Vienna. US is still separate from the others. And what we see, it doesn't need to be very easy right there. 
So whether US will return and whether the most important things, which are these uh, sunset clauses get fixed and whether the agreement or the deal will be extended to the missiles. I see those two as a most important points and thresholds for US access. If those don't take place, I don't see personally any reason for the US to enter to such an agreement. But before we go there, I ran quickly through the past several agreements which Iran has reached with various parties, with the EU, with the EU3, with uh, IAEA, with uh, some other parties, with France, and then at the very end as well, the JCPO. The second element is to keep its missile capabilities out of any negotiation. Third one is to reduce the sanctions extent possibilities. And this is also the priority order for these items. They are ready to accept sanctions if they can keep the enrichment. And a good example is this when 20, 2005 the Paris Agreement failed and the IAEA board started to to the issue and came with the resolution which eventually then led the dossier to UN Security Council. Then Iran had to do a hard decision. It knew that once it gets to the Security Council, consequence will be sanctions. But they still decided to keep the enrichment, slowly increase it, and then it went to the Security Council and then we then the story changed radically. And then we see several UN Security Council resources which ask Iran to suspend this and that, but they continued enrichment, they increased the enrichment. The other thing was the Tehran Research Reactor Agreement in uh, uranium outside of Iran. Uh, deal, but they didn't want to implement it immediately. Then after twists and turns in spring, uh, 2010, the Turks and Brazil and Iran suggested that let's do it now. But meanwhile, the inventory of uranium had come to double. So 1200 kilograms didn't have any meaning from the US point of view. And that's why then the US didn't uh, agree on the agreement. And similar instances, lost opportunities based on the Russian proposal, EU proposals, until then we came to the JCPOA process in 2012. And we know now what the JCPOA is. And now when we look at the negotiations in Vienna, certainly they had to be fairly quiet in order to not to reveal too much details, but the re what really disturbs me at this stage is that they are mainly talking about sanctions lifting, US talks, some kind of sequencing, but nobody talks about the fixing of the flaws of the JCPOA, not one word. So this is why we need to follow and make sure that particularly from the region, you people get the appropriate JCPOA because I still think it's more to do your security than my security somewhere in the middle of the United States of America. And then let's go now to the current status of the nuclear program very briefly. I based my talking points to the observations at the last annual nuclear technology day of the Iran when the dignitaries like Kamal Wandi or Saleh, he talked to the guy quite length. First of all, they plan to hasten the introduction of the enrichment capacity. You remember that it was supposed to be changing in 2030 when the major provisions of the JCPOA expired. Now they brought this 272,000 swoop per year capacity to be in place uh, four years from now. Then when you look at the rest of the nuclear program, uranium availability from domestic uh, resources, not even close to that. Today they produce 30 tons of yellow, 30, 40 tons of yellow cake per year after two decades of efforts. They say there will be four new uh, mines to come, but without any specifics. But even when you put all this together, 
I think at, at the time, four years from now, they are perhaps able to produce maximum uh, fuel, uh, maximum amount of uranium is probably to satisfy one half, one half of annual reload of one pusher reactor. So practically nothing, if you want to keep the pusher running. So the reason for uranium enrichment is somewhere else. Then we look the uh, uh, events after this explosion and uh, uh, disrupting the electricity system in, in, in uh, Natanz. They come up very quickly. Thousand IR2Ms are running. They promise to put soon another 1000 IR force in operation. And uh, Kamal Wandi said that uh, fairly soon they have 1000 uh, uh, IR6s in operation. Those are big numbers. And I think that they will, because the, this is one of the flaws of this whole regime from 2003 to today, that actually Iran was never blocked except one short period of time in 2005 to produce centrifuge components. Centrifuge consists of 100 mm -hmm. components. The one which was controlled by JCPO is just the rotor, one of the many, important, but one of the many. So they have stock of spare parts and they can boost up the production. And if you, I expect that this could be in a worst case, those 3000 centrifuges in operation by the end of this year, which means that uh, they will have, maybe half a year time, uh, they will have then 16,000 SWU per year capacity which is three times more than, or two times more, two, three times more than it was at the uh, JCPOA. And consequently, breakout times will come down. Then what they will do with this damage, 5,000 or so uh, IR1 centrifuges, that's a little bit more time consuming because when they get broken, they set, set shrapnels and dust to the cascade piping. So they have to pop it to replace everything. That takes perhaps half a year. But at the end of this year, we are talking of perhaps uh, something like close to 20,000 SWU. That's a big number for the country who do which doesn't need this one. And then the other needs, new fuel for the Heron Research Reactor. Reactor was built in mid-70s. It's coming to the end of its uh, lifetime. It has already production process for fuel. There's no need to have another one, and particularly the one which has, produces as an intermediate uranium metal. And then other things, IR-40 reactor, they will test the secondary coolant system in coming months. This is still with the old specifications. There has been no irreversible change in IR-40, which is under construction. They still have not decided which way to go, Plus on top of that, they now introduce a second IR40 to the panel and ask fun funding for the building. So that's about that part of the work. And I don't think that I will spend more time on the nuclear program itself. I also noticed then about the missile program at uh, these new missiles, there are half a dozen and uh, the Israeli ambassador wrote a good letter to the UN Security Council on that. Uh, there are half a dozen new missiles, including cruise missiles, which are nuclear capable if we define it by the payload. That is a matter of concern because they have also, some of them have solid fuel, which eases the use. And more dis equally disturbing is that some of this work has been done in, uh, together with the North Korea. This is reflected in a, a UN Security Council panel of experts report one month ago, which clearly points out uh, 13 North Korean individuals who were working with the, with the Iranians to develop the solid fuel. Then last but not the least, what to do with the nuclear archives. I don't want to repeat all the aspects, but Iran was actually prepared in early 2000s to build five nuclear devices, have a test site to test, so that by the test that it works for one, test site construction started, as we you see from the reports of FTD and ISIS in, in uh, 
DC. Iran was upset when the Ahmad project was ended in 2003. They made a political decision. We will maintain the information. We document it. I have seen a memo which asked them to do, and I have seen emails where uh, Mr. Fakri Sadeh and others uh, complain about it, and Hashi Chade. They were uh, archived, and some were continued, first in the universities, then SPND, and the workers maintained their capabilities. And this is important for Iran if they want to restore the program. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I'm a little bit concerned of one aspect after seeing personally those, those uh, files or some of them. This is not the way an organization archives its data. CDs, DVDs, maybe, but not the documents. This was a collection of documents, in my view, from the premises of those offices where the people were working. They were not the archives on organization. They are ma maintained differently. They are in order. There are no scrap papers in between those documents, etc. So we may still have some surprises there in terms of the documentation. IAEA got to a slow start, unfortunately, for a number of reasons. They have not done in the last three years much headway. We know that there are now undeclared or unreported, unexplained uranium particles, which points to the direction that some equipment is still there, which is single use, have not been destroyed, and there might be uranium left somewhere, natural uranium, samples, specimens, test pieces, which remain to be uh, declared. And in my view, the single use equipment should be destroyed because this is not something an NPT members, non-nuclear weapon state needs. Where IAEA will get now in next one month, hard to say, but it has been extremely slow. So I don't think we will be at the bottom of the nuclear archive file anytime soon. So in summary, three observations. Iran maintains and builds further its nuclear latency. It has been successful in enriching to higher levels, 20, 60, using very different scheme from the AQ Khan scheme, by the way, which speeds up the production, makes the location for final steps much smaller. Uh, it has infrastructure to produce centrifuges. Question mark is there for the nuclear part still. What, where are those? 10 locations which Ahman and Nesad said in 2010, which Saleh a year later said that two were considered to be uh, underground uh, enrichment plant. What is the status of that? Do they have equipment but not installed? These are the questions which I raise on the nuclear file. We need to put some uh, more assets from the international community to missile program to find the real status of uh, re-entry vehicles of those missiles or cruise missiles, where Iran is, where it ended up, where it is and has it developed it further. And then the last point there is to do with the uh, warhead fabrication facilities. Some of them are still there, the buildings, they should be investigated by IAEA. And again, single use cap capabilities should be dismantled. So if US, decides to return to the JCPOA without any changes. It's a return to yesterday. Iran's nuclear capabilities are today very different. Thank you. It's uh, really made me feel very bad. It, uh, it sounds that Iran is in a, in a very strong position and uh, is moving forward with its program and uh, cheating everybody without uh, any, any big problem. Uh, it's my turn, but uh, and I will try to explain the, the way we look at it from Israel, at uh, this uh, situation, uh, and to ask whether uh, and disagreement with the Americans is inevitable. It happens, it so happens that I'm speaking about it, just as uh, the Israeli delegation reaches uh, Washington to discuss the matter with their American counterparts. 
so Richard Goldberg is going to represent the Americans in a second, uh, but uh, I'll speak about the Israeli point of view. Now, basically, I think, yes, the disagreement uh, with the Americans is inevitable. And uh, it wasn't the case under Trump, but today this is, this is unfortunately the case. It's true that Israel and uh, the uh, United States are uh, committed to preventing Iran from having a nuclear weapon uh, at any given time. This is the common denominator that we have, the common goal that we have. But the, to the, as it comes to the question of what should be done in order to make it happen, in order to reach this goal, uh, we have two totally different uh, positions on, on that uh, respect. What we heard from the Americans, uh, and uh, Richard is probably going to dwell into that a little bit more, uh, is that what they want to do is to go back to the JCPOA, which uh, Oli just explained it's a little bit uh, going to yesterday when we, are already, when we are already in a totally different situation. But it's, this is what they say they want to do, to go back to the JCPOA. And uh, once everybody goes back to the J JCPOA and a certain sequence that is not totally clear, but even in the beginning, we, the sequence that the Americans presented was quite clear that uh, first of all, the uh, Iranians should be take uh, again uh, all the take upon themselves all the limits of the JCPOA and recommit to it and uh, undo everything that they did since they, the Americans left the JCPOA. And then the, uh, the sanctions will be lifted. Uh, and then once everybody goes back to the JCPOA, we start negotiating something that will deal with all the flaws and the problems that uh, both, uh, uh, well, actually everybody was referring to until now. And uh, this will lead us to a stronger and longer agreement and everybody is going to be happy and uh, Iran is not going to be able to have nuclear weapons. This is what uh, originally the Americans were saying. Now what we are saying, what we are listening to is uh, something uh, quite different. Now it's about uh, uh, some different sequence of coming back to the JCPOA in which the Americans can be satisfied with just being confident that the Iranians will at some point uh, return to the JCPOA and uh, take upon themselves their commitments. And that by itself would enable the Americans to lift the, some sanctions. And uh, the Americans are now uh, dividing the sanctions into three categories. Uh, so that they are definitely going to lift the, the sanctions that are uh, supposed to be lifted according to the JCPOA, and uh, they are not going to lift some other sanctions that are separate from the JCPOA, and there are some sanctions that uh, are, will, will not uh, imposed because of the JCPOA, but are considered by the Americans as uh, taken by the previous administration in order to prevent coming back to the JCPOA, so they may consider even taking them off. This is where we stand today. Nobody speaks really well. Occasionally, somebody mentions the issue of a longer, stronger agreement, but this is, uh, is not the main issue. And uh, that's where it stands today. For, from an Israeli point of view, this is really very frustrating. First of all, Israel is against the, the basic idea of going to the JCPOA, back to the JCPOA, because Israel considers the, the JCPOA as not a flawed agreement, but it's a disaster. As a, as a secured path for the Iranians to have within 15 years from the signing of the, or from the coming into effect of the agreement, namely in 2030 or 2031, the capability to produce a big arsenal of nuclear weapons without being exposed to any economic sanctions or to any threat of uh, military activity against their infrastructure, their nuclear infrastructure. That is what is guaranteed to the Iranians. And of course, this is why the Iranians are so eager to go back to the JCPOA because this is exactly what they want, where they want to be. They want to be in the JCPOA. And uh, we could have heard that uh, from uh, Zarif's uh, interview uh, in a couple uh, that was uh, actually given publicity in the last day, uh, that he was very furious at Suleimani for, because he thought that they shouldn't go there. And, uh, the, so the JCPOA is a flawed agreement. Uh, so that's the first thing. Secondly, what Israel is saying is, listen, even if you go to the JCPOA, you have no guarantee that the Iranians are not going to cheat again. The Iranians did cheat in the past and uh, they cheated in uh, preserving those archives. They cheated in uh, many other ways, including the, what, uh, the story of the uh, IR-40, what they did in the IR-40. And I want to share with you uh, a comic break 
uh, what uh, the director of the uh, Iranian Atomic Energy Agency, Mr. Z uh, Salehi, had to say about uh, how they cheated the international community before the United States left the uh, JCPOA. Please, Mr. Salehi. این راکتور آب سنگین رو بله. قلب راکتور گفتم با بوتون پر شده بله. این چیه داستانش بله دکتر؟ من تشکر میکنم بشمان. که واقعا شما این محبت کردید برای بینندگان عزیزمون ببینید ریاکتور عراق یک چاله ای داره که الان میبینید اون بله. مردم بله. دورش واسه اون چاله ریاکتور عراق درسته خب بله این چاله نهایتا کالاندریا میره توش و سوخت میره اون تو بله. ما مشابه اون لوله ها رو هم خریده بودیم ولی من اون زمان نمیتونستم اعلام بکنم بله. فقط یک نفر در ایران میدونست درسته و حالا بالاترین مقام ارشد نظام گفتیم کسی دیگه نمیدونست ما برای این که وقتی که مذاکره میکردن دوستان میدونستیم که اینا بالاخره بعد عهدی میکنن بعد قولی میکنن حضرت آقا فرموده بودن بله. که مواظب باشید اینا بد عهدن بد قولن خب ما بایستی با یه فراستی با یه هوشمندی کارمون رو انجام میدادیم یعنی علاوه بر این که پلهای پشت سرمون رو خراب نمیکردیم پل هم می ساختیم که اگر بله. قرار بود برگردیم سریعتر برگرد خب ما یه سری لوله بوده یه لوله هایی که مثلا به قطر دو سه سانت به طول سه چهار متر بله. خب مجسم کنید این لوله ها رو بله. که یه سر داره یه ته ما مشابه اون لوله ها هم خریده بودیم به همون تعداد اون لوله ها رو گفتن توش سیمان بریزید بله. خب ما اون لوله ها رو ریختیم گفتیم باشه چون اگر آج... اون موقع دیگه. بله آجانس نه 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 توی مذاکره مزا... که دیگه ما بله که مثلا بله. خب ما توی م... گفتیم باش ما میریزیم عنایت فرمودید بله. اما دیگه نگفته بودیم لوله های دیگه داریم چون اگر داشت میگفتیم میگفت آقا تو اون لوله ها بس ما الان خیلی چیز خب ما میریم حالا اون لوله الان میگیم الان داریم اون لوله ها رو حالا ما هر چی اینو میگیم اون وقت شما ببینید این تو فتوشاپ با فتوشاپ اومدن چاله ریاکتور و سیمان ریختن This is amazing. <laughs> This is just amazing how the IAEA was cheated by the Iranians. It was a Photoshop picture of uh, the core of the uh, IR-40 reactor. It's, it's unbelievable. So to trust the Iranians that they will uh, fulfill their part in the, in the JCPOA is like, have you learned no lesson? It's, uh, it's really ridiculous. And uh, of course, Israel cannot uh, accept that. Thirdly, We still believe that maximum pressure is the best way to get the attention of the Iranians. We don't think like the American uh, administration that maximum pressure failed. We just think that maximum pressure didn't have enough time to uh, deliver the results that it was supposed to, to deliver. And that maximum pressure can be supported by other means. Uh, I don't know, somebody exploded some explosives in the, in the Natanz facility and things like that happened. And they can be used you know, to deliver the message to the, to the Iranians that there are, there are alternatives uh, that uh, can uh, deny Iran the capability to produce nuclear weapons. And it's not, only, uh, the on, it's not the situation where the only option is to cave in, in in front of the Iranian brinkmanship policy. Now, regarding the brinkmanship policy, and uh, I think it's very important what Oli said about how close they get, but still we have to remember this brinkmanship policy leaves Iran with the threshold problem. If they want to cross from where they are today towards having 90% of rich uranium, if they want to cross from where they are today into the stage of weaponization of the fissile material that they can produce, they are going to be exposed not only to uh, harsh economic sanctions, but also to some sort of uh, kinetic uh, military activity that can prevent them from some of these uh, capabilities. Unfortunately, we don't hear it from the American administration these days the notion that we used to hear in the past that all options are on the table. And this is extremely important. I think it is some uh, could be uh, referred to that. It's uh, extremely important for the Iranians to know what are the consequences of trying to rush into the bomb today. They know that even though it's not mentioned. So it's uh, the, the path they are on today is only a brinkmanship uh, option, trying to convince the Americans to go back to the, to the agreement that giving them a good excuse to explain it to their uh, home uh, audience. But uh, the, in fact, this track is being blocked by, by the capabilities of the West and of Israel to prevent that from happening. So uh, what, is, what is needed today is not to go back to the agreement that cannot be uh, uh, returned to, because as uh, Mr. Heiner, Dr. Heinen said, 
there's no going back. I mean, Heinlein is not the only one who says those, uh, that uh, the, the director of the IEA today, Rafael Grossi, also says that there is no way back to the JCPOA because look, according to the JCPOA, the Iranians were supposed to be able to, to finish their development of IR6 only on year 10 of the agreement, namely about five years from today. But in fact, they've already produced uranium through the enrichment uh, in, in enriched with the IR6. It's, you cannot now take away from them the knowledge of how you uh, operate IR6. You cannot take away from them the fact that they have IR6. It's, uh, and IR6 are much more capable in enriching uranium than the IR1 that were allowed to the Iranians under the JCPOA. You cannot take away from them the ability to produce uranium metal. They've already done it. You cannot take away from them the capability to produce uh, uranium enriched to 60%. They've already done it. So uh, going back to the JCPOA is, is, a, is a fiction. There's no such thing. And uh, definitely doing it by accepting all the conditions of Iran regarding sanctions and forgetting about the longer and stronger option is, uh, is uh, so uh, counterproductive and, and uh, self-defeating if, if your mission is to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. So there is this notion that, uh, okay, we should go back to the what is left of the agreement, and then we should start negotiating a better deal. This is also a fictitious uh, statement because if the Iranians are not ready to accept a nuclear, a different nuclear deal when they are today under the sanctions, why would they accept something like that when the sanctions are lifted? And uh, in fact, the Iranians say very loudly and clearly that they are not going to accept any negotiations on this in the future, and uh, I believe them. Why, would, why should they? So what we think is that the maximum pressure should stay on. There should be more, should be more pressure. There should be attention given to the capability of uh, taking steps against the infrastructure of Iraq, of Iran, and the nuclear infrastructure of Iran. There should be more uh, support given to blocking Iran's regional attempts to gain more uh, influence and uh, to spread its hegemony. And when this all is going to be taken by the Biden administration, they, are, they may be much more effective than they, they were under the Trump administration because Biden, unlike Trump, has the capability to put on the, uh, on the bandwagon also people like uh, Germany, Britain, and this France that Trump had the difficulties in uh, doing so. And anyhow, uh, the Trump administration, if he decides to go there, he can rely on Israeli and the uh, Gulf uh, support in uh, uh, adopting this kind of policy. So this is in our mind in Israel what should be done. It's not going to happen in my mind because the Americans are determined to go in a different uh, path. And this means that we are going into some sort of a very uh, bitter misunderstanding and the disagreement between us and the uh, American administration in the coming month. So let me go now to uh, Mr. Richard Goldberg, who uh, is today with the uh, Institute uh, that's called the FDD, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Uh, Richard was from 2019 to 2020, uh, the director of counter for countering Iranian weapons of mass destruction for the White House National Security Council. So he was pretty much involved in uh, imposing all these sanctions on Iran in recent years. And uh, we would like to hear from Richard, uh, his opinion about uh, the American approach uh, to this question of uh, uh, the coming treatment of the Iranian nuclear project. Please, Richard. Great, thank you. And what an honor to be part of a trilateral uh, event like this. And obviously, one of the things uh, that has changed uh, dramatically since the 2015 nuclear deal that's self-evident in this entire webinar, but uh, unspoken, uh, is the Abraham Accords uh, and the changing uh, dynamic of the region that that nuclear deal brought uh, the Arabs and Israelis together uh, and that now we hear the Middle East outside of Iran speak with one voice to Washington, uh, not, uh, not squabbles, uh, not questions of what the threat of the region is. And it's something that plays a dynamic in what I'll talk about. The American perspective uh, on JCPOA and on where we're at here is not so simple uh, to say this is what the Biden administration thinks and this is the opponents. The American government, uh, the system of government, with a divided uh, system of government between the White House and Congress, 
and also a federal system of Washington and state governments uh, means that you have to really uh, look three dimensionally at the American perspective to understand what will US policy be going forward and what will the impact be on Iran no matter the conclusion from the Biden administration. If I put myself in the shoes of, of some of the people inside uh, the senior uh, areas of the Biden White House and State Department and give you their argument for a moment uh, before I, I shift to Congress uh, for a more critical view, I would say that they look at uh, the maximum pressure campaign as a failure uh, because, first of all, they're quite wedded to the JCPOA. Almost all of these officials were in the Obama administration and helped negotiate the deal. And so emotionally, if you uh, cement the deal and you believe in the deal and you sell the deal, uh, then you will always believe that you were right. Uh, it's very difficult to look back in time and say this was flawed, we made mistakes, we shouldn't go back to it. And the dynamic of the polarization in the United States of anything that Trump did uh, reflexively being bad uh, in the view of most Democrats adds to this. And so the idea that the Trump administration, that President Trump left the Iran nuclear deal already creates a massive uh, partisan backlash uh, that obviously this was the wrong decision. And look, everything that everyone has talked about on this uh, webinar to date means that the Iranian nuclear program is more advanced and more dangerous and more threatening than it was before Trump left the nuclear deal, which means that uh, for the most important of all the threats that we talk about of Iran, uh, the maximum pressure campaign has failed on the merits, at least to date. Uh, then we have to say, okay, what is the most important national security priority facing the United States? Uh, it is, in the view of the president today, limiting uh, Iran's nuclear enrichment. It is, they call it putting Iran back in the box. Now the question of course of, well, what about all these undeclared nuclear sites and activities that we're starting to hear about from the IAEA? Where is the material? Where are the sites? Where is the equipment? What's going on with this nuclear archive we discovered in the interim? Uh, they simply believe uh, that this is historical in nature, uh, that uh, there, there may be elements there that we need to learn from. We need to press the Iranians on it but that does not have to come at the expense of limiting the declared enrichment at declared sites of Iran, which is at least in their view and in the intelligence community assessment to date publicly, uh, the most uh, poignant threat opposed by Iran's nuclear program. We can continue to talk about the archive and other issues on a different track, uh, so long as we get uh, Iran's nuclear program back in a box. Now, what about the idea that we would be handing over billions of dollars again for Iranian terrorism and missile development uh, and other malign activities? Again, they would say, as the president told Tom Friedman uh, back at the beginning during transition in his early presidency in his interview, there is nothing more important to him of all the threats than the nuclear program. Everything else takes a back seat. There was terrorism before the JCPOA, there was terrorism during the JCPOA, and there was terrorism after the JCPOA. What concerns US national security the most is putting this nuclear program in a box. And so that is their uh, highest uh, regard, which is why you hear latest reports they are willing to lift terrorism sanctions and effectively subsidize the IRGC, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps budget, if in exchange Iran does agree uh, to get rid of some of its enriched uranium stockpile and reduce the level of its enrichment. That it views as a good deal for US national security. And then you come to the point of, well, what about the missiles? As Ali pointed out at the beginning, uh, what about the fact that these are nuclear capable missiles? These are the delivery systems for nuclear weapons and you're allowing them to continue development on challenge with a larger budget. You come back to the initial question that would have faced uh, the same team under the Obama administration in 2015. Why did you agree to this deal that did not cover missiles and other issues? Why did you agree to this deal with sunset provisions? And they would say, well, we know that once we are in this deal and we have concluded and we have shown the Iranians that there are benefits to doing a deal with the West, there are economic benefits to not having threatening programs, then we will be able to come to them and negotiate a follow-on agreement. So the same criticism that's leveled today of your nearing sunset agreements, some have already come and gone, others uh, are, are nearer in the future, and also you're still not addressing missiles, they would point back to papers like Robert Einhorn, uh, who was an Obama administration official, also a Clinton administration official who worked on the agreed framework on North Korea back in the 1990s, and look at what JCPOA 2.0 should look like. 
What more can we offer the Iranians on top of the money we've provided under the JCPOA to encourage them to adopt similar type limits on their missile program, where again, you don't have true dismantlement, you don't have irreversible uh, commitments, uh, but they would limit uh, certain uh, parts of their arsenal, they wouldn't test certain parts of their arsenal for additional benefits. They call this idea more for more. Now, that's where the Biden administration sits today. There are some uh, in their camp, uh, particularly the special envoy for Iran, uh, Robert Malley, uh, who ideologically, based on his past statements uh, and writings, truly believes ideologically in the JCPOA as a bridge towards Iranian moderation, that Iran does not have to be an enemy of the United States, that it could be a potential partner in the region, that we have common threats, common interests, and if we can uh, get some of the past issues going back to 1953 out of the way, uh, we can clear the air and move forward. That a lot of these issues of terrorism, quote unquote, uh, and missile development are not irrational. They are quite rational based on how Iran, the Islamic Republic sees the region, and that this is largely a regional conflict that the United States shouldn't be taking sides in. That if we can contain the nuclear program, the true threat to the United States, uh, then we can convene regional actors to talk about regional issues that would include missiles, and what the United States labels as terrorism. There are others uh, that are more pragmatic, uh, who don't view Iran that way, who do believe that Iran is an evil state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, but they also uh, say that we have a lot of things going on in the world today, China, Russia, uh, other issues we need to deal with. We don't want to have a nuclear crisis with Iran in the first 100 days of this presidency. We will get to other issues later with Iran. We don't need to have a war right now. We don't need to have a crisis right now. We want to get on to other issues on the president's agenda. And of course, we still have the coronavirus. We have domestic issues like an infrastructure bill the president's putting forward. Get this off the front burner. We still have a couple more years till the worst sunsets come. Let's kick the can down the road by essentially paying Iran's extortion racket and giving us more time to focus on other issues here at home. That is absolutely a view of some inside the Biden White House. It's not ideological about the JCPOA. It's pragmatic of, I don't wanna work on this today. What will it cost to get it off the front burner? Now in the Congress, people say, wow, this was a bad deal that we opposed back in 2015. You never submitted it to us, to the United States Senate as a treaty. This is a political agreement, which means just as the world saw in 2018, if you just go along with sanctions relief provided by one president under this non-binding political agreement called the JCPOA, and you go back into Iran and you try to reinvest and, and take advantage of sanctions relief, if a Republican president uh, comes back into the White House, or if Republicans take control of Congress, the House and Senate in the next midterm election, you could be in for a great big awakening just like you were in 2018. And so you're seeing massive numbers of Republicans in the House and Senate putting forward a series of legislative packages that mirror the maximum pressure campaign as it has been, that we should not be lifting any sanctions on Iran until Iran agrees to curb all of its malign activities, not just temporary narrow limits on its nuclear program. That is a message to the market, not just to the Biden administration, of beware. We may take back to Congress and send something that is very politically difficult for President Biden to veto in two years, or we may take back the White House with any number of these senators uh, or former officials uh, who are for maximum pressure and against the JCPOA. And so sanctions will be back, it's just a matter of when, and that will probably dampen any benefits Iran gets, even if sanctions relief is granted by the Biden administration. One other piece of this puzzle that Congress views uh, very, very problematically, and that is the issue of terrorism sanctions and missile sanctions on Iran. This is something that probably is the most worrisome of the changing dynamic that Yosu talked about of the Biden administration's uh, policy negotiating posture at the table in Vienna. Early on in this administration, Tony Blinken, uh, when he was up for confirmation as Secretary of State, was asked point blank by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, will you keep terrorism sanctions on Iran, sanctions on the central bank, on its oil company, sectors of Iran that are tied to terrorism specifically by the US Treasury Department. And he said it is not in the interest of the United States to lift those sanctions and that those sanctions are not inconsistent with the JCPOA. 
That is a view that he also declared during the 2020 presidential campaign, during an interview with an outlet called the Jewish Insider, in which he vowed that no matter what the Biden administration would do on the JCPOA, they would keep all non-nuclear sanctions in place. And indeed, that is the policy of the Obama White House when they told the American people what the JCPOA was and what it was not. They said, and it's in writing, the United States would always be allowed to impose non-nuclear sanctions after agreeing to the initial sanctions relief from JCPOA. They specifically mentioned the authority to use terrorism sanctions under a specific executive order that the Trump administration then used to designate a number of entities throughout Iran due to their support for the IRGC. Why did this all happen uh, during the Trump administration's time in office? It was not to prevent and make it more difficult to go back to JCPOA, as you're hearing the Biden administration uh, claim to try to justify why they're going to lift these terrorism sanctions now, caving to Iranian demands. In fact, it was Congress on a bipartisan basis in 2017, while Trump was still in the JCPOA, that passed a big counter IRGC law, sanctions law, that mandated the president to impose sanctions on all affiliates of the IRGC. That bill had actually passed the Senate almost unanimously on its own as an Iran sanctions bill, and then was put into a larger sanctions package along with Russia sanctions, a bill called CATSA, people may remember in 2017, and then signed by the president. Almost unanimous, Democrats and Republicans during the nuclear deal imposing additional sanctions on Iran outside its nuclear program. And so we fast forward to today and Congress is saying, wow, we were told that you could always have terrorism and missile sanctions on Iran, no matter what we did with JCPOA. And now the Biden administration is changing that position of the United States interpretation and saying, no, if there are terrorism sanctions or missile sanctions on entities for which we originally promised sanctions relief, we are not allowed to have those sanctions in place anymore. We must lift those sanctions. That is going to be a big problem for Congress if that indeed happens. And so we'll see the legislative push could be bipartisan, could be an amendment to a must pass piece of legislation. That might be a showdown we see over terrorism and missile sanctions later this year. Two more points and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, one more piece, American hostages. Uh, there is a huge number of people in the Congress uh, who have constituents who have been touched uh, by not just American terrorism, but American hostage taking as well. There's been no word that any American hostages will be freed as part of lifting sanctions. And indeed, there is a large swell of members of Congress who believe that no sanctions relief should be provided until American uh, hostages are all released. There are other citizens of other countries as well who are unjustifiably detained in Iran. That is not apparently on the table. Uh, as Congress looks forward uh, again, uh, there will be opportunities to legislate, but also opportunities for governors and mayors and state legislatures to legislate. One of the interesting things we forget about because it was so long ago is in the 2000s, there was a movement to divest public pension funds from companies that invested in Iran's energy sector in the states and local governments. And over half the states of the union adopted these measures. Some went beyond that to insurance sanctions and financial sanctions. Those are still on the books largely. And in fact, it worries the Iranians greatly. They mentioned it in the JCPOA that it was incumbent on the United States at the federal level to take all possible steps to prevent those state and local actions from interfering with sanctions relief. It is possible in this polarized environment that red states could adopt additional measures that indeed would interfere with international banks and companies uh, trying to get back into Iran on top of the threat of a Republican takeover of Congress or a return uh, to the White House. So the picture here is unfortunate on the federal level. It does look like the executive branch uh, will be moving towards rejoining the JCPOA without any uh, hope of a longer agreement, without any improvements to that agreement, without any uh, justification or accountability for the undeclared nuclear activities uh, currently in Iran, without any American hostages uh, being released, and giving up America's position that we are allowed to impose terrorism and missile sanctions regardless of the initial sanctions relief provided under JCPOA. You will have a backlash from some in Congress, certainly from a unified Republican position, possibly on some of those issues like terrorism, missiles, or hostages, a bipartisan coalition to emerge, 
And you'll also have to see what happens on the local level uh, from states uh, and cities throughout the country. Richard, if I can just follow up with a, with a question. Some people say, okay, maybe the best thing was not to leave the JCPOA in the first place uh, or leave it under the snapback uh, option. Uh, because today we are not going back to the JCPOA, uh, in fact, but we are going to, uh, not back, we are going to a worse version, uh, or worse version of the JCPOA. As, as somebody who worked for the Trump administration, uh, what do you say about this claim? Yeah, I mean, listen, amazingly, uh, President Biden inherited more leverage than Congress gave President Obama when you compare 2021 to 2013, right? So 2013 is really the year to talk about, not 2015 when we talked about the conclusion of JCPOA, 2013 and the entry to the interim deal JPOA. That's when America gave up its leverage, right? It was a fait accompli at that point of dancing around the details. But America lifted many of its sanctions and gave Iran pause of, of sanctions pressure in 2013 in exchange for certain uh, limited nuclear concessions that let, then led to the full JCPOA. If you go back to 2013, the central bank of Iran under sanctions, but not all of its oil exports, right? The price of oil was over $100 a barrel. A lot of political risk uh, in the US to try to drive Iranian oil exports to zero at that time. And so we didn't do that. We left them around a, a million or more barrels per day on the market. Uh, we had not closed off several other sectors of the economy, and we certainly didn't go after the entirety of its financial sector back then. Uh, a report in October of 2013, put out by FDD and Rubini uh, Economics at the time, uh, said that we believed Iran was down to $20 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves and that it would be able to muddle along for at least another year. So we were not at the maximized pressure point. Flash forward to today, we've just learned while these talks are going on in Vienna, and while there's a setback to its nuclear program at the times, that the IMF reports an updated number. By the end of 2020, Iran was down to $4 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves. That is unbelievable success of maximum pressure. And the trajectory, if you look at the pace of Iran's burning through cash towards the end of 2020, meant that if the psychology had remained in place, that sanctions were gonna be staying and coming on more and more, that was a regime in serious, serious crisis. $120 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves in 2018, down to $12 billion at the end of 2019, down to $9 billion, by fall of 2020, down to $4 billion by the end of 2020. The burn rate was accelerating. The Iranians had finally not been able to cope with the maximum pressure campaign. And that's why you saw the tanker get seized from the South Koreans in the Gulf, attacks in Iraq. They were flailing very early on in the Biden administration to get attention very quickly and try to force exactly what they forced in Vienna because the maximum pressure campaign was so close to being successful. We had already drained their accounts of the IRGC and their missile program, their defense budget, which by the way, is good for US national security and good for the region on its own merits. The rest was propaganda. The rest was a Potemkin village to scare the Americans into sanctions relief. Really. And unfortunately, the propaganda, the Potemkin village worked at the worst possible time. And so it looks like today, Biden inherited more pressure and leverage than Obama had, and he is going to give up more than Obama gave up in JCPOA. That is an amazing thing to think about. Thank you. So, okay, we, I think, get a, quite a clear picture of the situation in the uh, uh, nuclear realm, which is, as I said, not very promising, and uh, especially what you said in the end is uh, raising my eyebrows. Why is this happening? But uh, now we shall go to the uh, discussion about the Iranian, uh, uh, sorry, the Iranian regional and domestic challenge, the second session, and uh, its malign activities across the Middle East and North Africa. And we shall start with uh, Javad Khadem. Uh, Javad is a, a co-founder of the Unity of, for Democracy in Iran, organization, positional organization. 
which works to promote the democratic aspirations of the Iranian people. He served as the Minister of Housing and Development uh, in the government of Prime Minister Shakur Bakhtiar just prior to the 1979 Iranian Revolution that uh, brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power and later coordinated the 1981 Nuzha military uprising against the Islamic Republic of Iran. So he's, he has a history of working for the benefit of the Iranian people. Uh, whenever I speak with Javad, I'm thinking about the Iranian people who are suffering from all this. They have $4 billion uh, left. This is affecting them, but they are more worried, I think, about the way the regime treats them and uh, the, the, the way that the international community actually ignores the human rights uh, situation in Iran is uh, definitely causing them more trouble than the, just the economic situation. Uh, can you share with us, Javad, the, the view from Tehran, how the situation there, the pressures, the fight against the, the West, the internal uh, tensions that we saw with the uh, Zarif uh, interview, but uh, coming, coming to the election, uh, how all of that uh, impacts the situation in Iran, especially when we look at the relationship between elections to the presidency, uh, in Iran and uh, the negotiations on the nuclear fire. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I hope you let me spend around about a couple of minutes on the discussion you had uh, just now. Uh, and I put, maybe it's not a bad idea, put my idea about what you were saying and our friend, especially Ali, which I have a great respect for him. Um, there is one thing I, I can tell you, I, I hate to be uh, devil's advocate, but sometimes I have no, uh, uh, no way getting out of it, because after all, I'm a patriot, I'm Iranian, you have to bear that in mind, uh, and I know you know it. Um, I think you can, uh, you can prevent uh, on short term, Iran to have nuclear uh, bomb. I don't know whether you can do it in medium term, but definitely I know you will not be able to stop them having atomic bomb on long term. Not because of Israel or Arabs or, or, or mullahs or anything like that. But there is one thing on Iranian psychic, one Iraq war if you remember, still is there. They think if they had atomic bomb, then Saddam wouldn't dare to attack Iran. This is one. And secondly, there is a mentality of the revolution, which is, I understand it quite well. We should not subcontract our security to anybody, never mind America or Russia. So this, this is, uh, I think, international community has to bear that in mind, that will happen one day. How to deal with it is, is a bit difficult, but it, this is a reality which I'm saying to you uh, because I keep hearing it and I know it. I have a lot of contact inside and most of them believing that is how it's going. It doesn't matter whether Khamenei is there or X or Y, Z. So I hope I've made my, my view about uh, nuclear deal as it is clear to you. Um, I hope you will find short term. In short term, I think uh, with a bit of courage, they will, you will manage it because as uh, Goldberg was saying about Iranian economy is in, in dire shape. And not only the reserves, everything is built and employment, you name it. I mean, there is so much difficulty, which is not, it's not only due to sanction, but the the problem is they can survive longer and longer. They have learned in the last four years how to survive. That has to be bear in mind as well. And historically, Iranian are people of survival. They always survive in bad condition. So uh, that, that is my view about what you were discussing. I'm glad you, you let me speak about it. But there is another process in Iran, which is definitely uh, international community has to take notice of it. I think uh, sanction has had a big effect on it. Despite I being against the sanction, the reason was once you 
make Iranian people poor, there is no chance of uprising in Iran. That has always been my view and it still is today. But sanction had one big effect, and that is, okay, if the sanction continue, what we have to do? That is very important thing. So I think in certain a circle in Iranian regime, even among the ordinary people, reg Iranian regime has to go through a, a transformation. Transformation in a sense that they have to change the framework of the regime. And every day you hear it. In actual fact, when you listen to the election campaign in Iran, you can see it. And there are a lot of, lot of, lot of noises inside Iran that maybe, maybe we need a military government in Iran, which the help of the technocrat, they build up a new Iran. That has happened in Iranian history quite a few times. When the country gets to this situation, there are a lot of people, get a, a, a minority get together, no, we can't stand this one, and try to save the country. I think we get in there. But Khamenei knows that as well. And uh, there are a rumor that, uh, although I know for a fact that, uh, I hope I know it before Khamenei decide who is going to next Iranian president, but he, he hasn't made up his mind. And that's, in, in, a, in my mind, depend in the next couple of months negotiation in Vienna. If it goes smoothly the way people like Zarif and Rouhani won, then you might not get a military uh, government, but most probably by military government, I mean somebody from army or somebody from Pastoran become become president. And there are a couple of names already, uh, a new one, because how many, uh, in my opinion, will not go with the established name like Qalibov and Jalilvan and all that. It goes with the name like Dehran or Said or Said Muhammad, this sort of people who are new, new in political scene in Iran. So that, that could happen depend on Vienna talk. That's, this is why uh, international community decide to give a leverage to Iran in the negotiation, then uh, we might have a totally different approach to Iranian election. Uh, but I'm 100% I'm sure Khamenei hasn't made up his mind who should be prime, uh, who should be president. And there is another problem inside Iran that you refer to it. And uh, uh, this file, or oral history, that a couple of uh, nights ago uh, was exposed, and uh, practically every, everybody knows about it. It's about seven hours. I listened to all of it, which is amazing. A foreign minister of uh, Iran says such a things, which is shows my fear all the time that a regime is on verge of implosion if international community is not ready for it. Implosion in, in Iran will be a chaos, which is nobody can control it, even if, say, foreign troops start, foreign country decided, okay, this is time to, to send our troop inside Iran, like Afghanistan. I don't think they can do that. But this is shows there are a lot of ways that future of Iran can be better. Because after all, uh, Zarif is a personality been in there for the last 40 years, from the time he was 19 years old, up to now that Iran was 16, 65 years old. And uh, he fears one thing, that our dependence on Russia is not that brilliant and on longer term will not be accepted by Iranian people because I don't need to tell the panel that uh, Iranian Russia is a how do a long distance enemy of Iran due to historically you cannot avoid that one so there is no love affair between Iranian people and Russia therefore that is why he said one word, he said only one word about Russia, and that was sufficient to make worry Pastoran about it. Because Pastoran 
uh, most probably rely on the help from Russia in case of anything happening. So uh, mm -hmm. Zarif knew how to hit them and he did it very well because he knows Iranian uh, hate, Not, I, I can't use the word hate, but dislike Russian policy inside Iran. And he clearly indicated we should not go along that and we have to go back and negotiate with America and have a better relation with America. And that should be our future. That is the view of Zarif and Rouhani. Rouhani always was there, but Zarif has, has come to that. I don't know whether what will happen to Zarif is a very, very complicated issue because it depends on Khomeini. Khomeini might like this idea because if he really wants to transfer Iran, uh, the regime, so this, this can be a beginning of that. And unfortunately, there is another problem inside Iran. There is this apathy of voting. Opposition has succeeded in persuading Iranian people. What's the use of keep going to election and voting? They say, uh, you choosing between bad and worse. We never get any improvement in our international relation, our economy is dead and unemployment is, is 8 million, 9 million, 10 million, God knows, and we have run about uh, 35 million and the red uh, level of income. And, and on top of that, million people have left Iran. All the brains which should run a country has left the country. So th these, are, these, these are the things that uh, helping uh, opposition uh, persuade Iranian people not to participate in, in, in election, which is Khomeini doesn't like it. This, this is the problem because he always think whatever happened, the regime needs support of Iranian people. This is uh, last last election. There was forty three percent of people voted. They suggest this, today's suggestion is it can be between twenty nine to thirty five percent, which is disastrous for Khomeini. Khomeini does not uh, want to. Um, fix the election in a way that say, okay, it's 20 people, 35% people wouldn't. And he said, no, 55% people as well. They can do that, but he doesn't like that because he, he knows it's not, it will not be a secret thing. So he's worried. And that's why, why, in my opinion, he might let uh, Zarif to get away with what he has, the, his statements. And let Zarif, whoever Zarif supports, uh, maybe become the guy become uh, next president in Iran, because Zarif can bring people to polling station. That is the last card Khomeini has. If he decides that, then Khomeini, uh, Zarif will be a prominent figure in election and maybe after election, if he doesn't himself. Uh, decide to be candidate, or at the at the moment there is no sign of it. But Khomeini has a persuasion, as 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 such a control on the on the on the on the regime that he can ask, despite uh, Zarif not wanting to be president, make sure that he is president because of what I said regarding the uh, the legitimacy of the regime, which Khomeini knows he needs Iranian people's votes. That is definite. And secondly, about what, how, they, how they're going to approach the nuclear deal. I, I believe, and the information I have, which is not as good as the first part of the Barjom, but in the second part of Barjom, I think they can settle with such a thing around about one and a half to two million barrel a day to sell oil and get the money back. Because on that basis, they can rebuild their economy to some extent and rebuild their res reserves. And I am not going along the way that um, a lot of commentators believe that they, they're going to continue with their uh, uh, malign activity in Middle East, which they don't call it malign. They call it a part of their revolution in, in Islamic world. So that is a chance, I think, uh, at the first stage, they will uh, accept to stop so-called malign activity. And, uh, and that could be beginning of a new phase 
in foreign policy of Iran, for example, uh, negotiation with Saudi Arabia is going quite well, quite well, because Saudi Arabia uh, has a problem on the long term with Iran. They cannot ignore Iran. They know how effective they are in among the Shia in the Middle East. Nobody sh should underestimate that one. It's not only their, their, their war or their, but they are influential and uh, Iraq uh, totally is in their control when you think about it. Therefore, that is, uh, that is one thing which is uh, panel or international community has to consider that uh, opening the way Iran to start negotiating with the Persian Gulf states is a way forward. And the regime wants, if people like Zarif, Rouhani, or somebody like Dehran, Dehran, if he become, I think he's a dark horse in the election. And you, you might get him as president because he is, uh, one good thing about Dehran, just for your information, he's not cropped financially. He might have rebuilt the uh, Hezbollah or he's done something in, in uh, uh, South America and all that, I understand that one. But he is not financially corrupt. And that's a big, big uh, point in the coming election. So he will go along that one because I saw an interview from him, which is very uh, important. Uh, I got a couple of contact with some of his advisors. He says, we don't have permanent enemy and we don't have short friends. So that is that is a good sign. He, he and I think Israel, um, which I always supporter of Israel and Jewish community, and for last forty, and I always wanted to make sure Iran and Israel has a better relation because that is the key in peace in Middle East, and uh, that that is in my mind very important that. Uh, people in Israel start thinking about what will happen if a military man really take control of the presidency. That means the whole, every single uh, institution in Iran become one. That means from Pasaran, from uh, parliament, from everywhere else. So you get a unity government. And that's, I think you can deal better with it. And therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they will speak with one language. And therefore, all this different vibe which is coming out of Iran will, will be stopped. And that's, that is, in my opinion, a good sign. And I hope, I, I personally hope that they can't get there. Because as I say, Iran is uh, iron fist for a while to put the put the international relation in a better better way and and that way uh, we will might see a change in attitude towards bomb atomic bomb i hope i try to explain as much as i i know it and if uh, if there is any it, question i can the pleasure answer it uh, as I, say, I, try to, I, I try to be devil's advocate don't, yeah. don't forget that. So, <laughs> This was definitely a devil's advocate because uh, most people think that uh, such a government led by uh, somebody from the IRGC is going to be more stubborn, more uh, difficult to deal with. And you say it's actually an opportunity. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The reason is one of the... Um, because the unity in the ruling... Uh, elite in Iran is not there. The reason everybody has an interest. Uh, reformists have an interest. Uh, hardliners have an have a, uh, interest. In the middle, they have different interests. But once this is one unit, I think their approach will be different because they want to survive. That, that, that is the whole thing. The regime... Uh, is not, if they don't transfer, let me put it another way, if they don't transfer and continue the same way, I don't think they will last another election. That That is, and, and of course Khomeini is in the verge of 
I don't I don't think he will die soon, but but obviously okay, who will okay, the next, that's another point which which is which is which is difficult to guess who is going to be. And and I don't think many people think it will be his son. He won't let that happen. He he knows that that is the most dangerous thing to do. Thank you, Javad. We shall move to uh, Colonel Segel, uh, is a uh, senior fellow at the uh, Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs and previously has been in charge of uh, Iran in the Israeli military intelligence or defense intelligence. And uh, Miki, uh, what is in your mind, the, uh, from an Israeli perspective, we heard an, an Iranian perspective. From an Israeli perspective, how do you see the developments in Iran, their effect on the Iranian behavior in the region? And what does it mean for Israel, also in the context of the nuclear uh, discussions? Well, first, I want to thank Mr. Javad Khadem for advocating so good uh, the regime. Maybe I'll take him as my solicitor in, in the future because he really did a very good job and optimistic one, if I may say. Um, but unfortunately, from my perspective, from Israel perspective, we can see we are now just uh, two weeks ahead of uh, Quds Day, uh, International Quds Day, and then we, really, we will probably hear Iranian uh, stating again how they feel about Israel and the United States uh, in the last uh, week, the last Friday of the, of the Ramadan. Um, and connecting this to the, um, to the upcoming elections in June, I think the, um, the election will not change anything in Iranian uh, malign uh, behavior in uh, in uh, the region, and I think the uh, what the American um, administration is trying to do in uh, Vienna, and now I heard that uh, William Barnes is in Baghdad, coincides with Zarif being in Baghdad. Uh, I think we should look at, to other places, not just Vienna, to see what's going on in the uh, upcoming uh, the reloading JCPOA. Uh, Ojospa, one, one uh, president said. Um, I think if there will be, there are a lot of candidates uh, in the Iranian presidential election. You mentioned uh, Dahran, and of course there are others. Ibrahim Raisi is the conservative uh, um, candidate, and of course uh, Muhammad Jawad Zarif with his uh, leaked uh, interview. And I think he, he sees himself as a, he wants to bid for presidency. And we can see in the last few days or weeks even, a lot of, he draws a lot of fire from a conservative uh, camp. In Iran, we see a lot of cartoons depicting him as a target back of, of the, uh, of the um, uh, American administration. Uh, using his back for to snipe on the Iranian industry, there are very good cartoons depicting uh, uh, Zarif, and I think he, uh, the conservative camp is um, trying to target him, to to smear him, to blame him for the collapse of the Iranian economy, uh, for conducting very poor negotiations on the JCPOA. Um, but if we go back to to the region, I think uh, the Iranian malign activity will not uh, will not change. Uh, on the contrary, uh, we can see if, if, if we just take, for instance, uh, Yemen as the, the experiment uh, ground for Iranian uh, latest developments in drones, uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and we can see every week we, we witness uh, attacks on Saudi oil infrastructure, the Aramco infrastructure in uh, places in uh, in Saudi Arabia and also missile firing from Iraqi militias towards uh, Saudi uh, towards Saudi uh, Arabia. And uh, also the conflict in Yemen is not on the verge of being uh, resolved and we, can know, we, we know very well the Iranian activity uh, in the region. From Israeli perspective, what I'm worried is the technologies that the Iran, the missile technologies and other uh, waterborne technologies in Iran is using in Yemen, uh, we'll, we'll see these technologies, these tactics um, in, in, in future, um, in future uh, confrontations between uh, Hezbollah and Israel 
Israeli gas rigs in the, in the, in the Mediterranean. And we can see that Iran tried to copycat tactics from Yemen to the, to the Mediterranean, uh, as it did in the past from copycatting, <clears throat> copycatting uh, IDs, the FPs from, from Lebanon to Iraq and other places <clears throat> where coalition, <clears throat> sorry, where coalition forces uh, are, are deployed. Um, so th this is one of the biggest uh, 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 worries uh, that they have concerning Iran activity uh, in the region. And of course, Iran uh, gaining more uh, money uh, as a result of the reloaded uh, JCPOA uh, could make them uh, turn more, more uh, effort to financing uh, Hezbollah and other uh, organization uh, in the region. Of course, now Iran, I think, if you look from Iranian perspective, uh, and I think Iran sees everything, uh, at least in the past, as a divine intervention. And, <clears throat> and we tend to neglect the religious part of the Iranian thinking. From the Iranian point of view, there is, there is and they believe that there is a, a divine intervention in, in what's happening in, in the strategic vision in, in this region. For instance, uh, the Americans did the job in Afghanistan for them, then Saddam Hussein, then the wars in, in Gaza and in, in Lebanon, and now uh, they survived uh, four years of, um, of, of sanctions and, and they survived it. And from that perspective, it, it, it's a sign. It's important sign, too important for them to give up uh, their stand in the current negotiations in Vienna or other places. Uh, in the region. And I think this, this uh, development, this divine intervention as they see it, uh, will enable them to, to proceed with their export of the revolution, um, which is one of the most important pillars of, 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 of Iran, to export the revolution, Shiite version, the Isna Sharia version of the revolution uh, to Iraq, uh, to, to Lebanon, to Syria, and, and, and and other places uh, in, in Bahrain and other places where the uh, uh, majority of Shiites in, in Bahrain. Uh, and I think Iran will see more of this, especially if, if sanctions will be uh, removed and Iran will feel free. Uh, it, it also, it, it now feels some kind of, of a relief, though the domestic situation is very poor. They, they feel it really, we can see that they are very confident in Vienna we can see one line, one line in Iran concerning what should be done in Vienna, a verification of American lifting of the sanction and then Iran uh, reverse its, uh, um, the steps that it took uh, to, to uh, as a reprisal for the, uh, um, uh, the, the steps that the, uh, um, that the Europeans cannot provide for the JCPOA. Um, so to sum it up, we can see that Iran will be uh, more confident. We'll see uh, more Iran boldness in their uh, regional um, subversion and the terrorist ac activity, especially in Iraq and Yemen and, and, uh, and, and Syria, in, in Syria. Would you say, Miki, that this is going to happen either way? I mean, both if they, if they gain more money and they are, have more resources, to go farther in this direction. And if they are put under pressure and they want to put pressure on the Americans, it will also escalate uh, in, the, in the region? I think they, they, they are already, uh, I think they are already do, uh, doing it. They, they demonstrated that they can do it. They did it a few times, very uh, uh, precise, with, with very precise, um, um, let's say how, how to put it, uh, they demonstrate that they, they have the capability uh, to hurt Americans where they, where they are exposed. In Iraq, in the green zone, they, they, can, they can make the, the Shia militias in Iraq fire almost at will. Uh, when, when there is a sign from Tehran, they are doing this. They, they also uh, made the, the, the Shia militias in Iraq fire from Iraq to Saudi Arabia, which was rather new. And the, I think that they put all their tools uh, at sea, in the Gulf, uh, the Persian Gulf or the Arab Gulf, if you want to intimidate the Iranians, uh, uh, they show their uh, capability 
uh, to use all kinds of measures to, uh, to target uh, the United States interest, both military and civilian interest in, in Iraq and other places. Well, including Israel, I guess, it's, uh, but we shall move to that, with that to uh, Admiral Yari. Uh, Admiral Didi, yeah, Didi Yari is the former commander of the Israeli Navy, he was the commander of the Navy between 2000 and 2004 and uh, was also the commander of uh, the Naval Commando, the Shaita 13, and, uh, and later on was the CEO of Israel's arm producer, uh, Rafael. And uh, we asked uh, Didi that uh, you analyze for us the emerging naval struggle in the Middle East, in all the fronts that it's happening, uh, in the Red Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Arabian Gulf, in the Indian Ocean, it's, uh, it's all over the place and uh, speak about uh, the threats that uh, emanates from that and the capabilities of the Iranians to go to cause more trouble. Please, Didi. Well, I think the first two things that, that might be said about the maritime arena here is A, it's a show, it's a, a sideshow of everything else. And second, uh, the, um, there is a considerable asymmetry here between the two players, Israel and Iran. Uh, and strangely enough, it's the symmetry uh, towards, uh, towards us, because basically Israel has uh, zero interest in the Persian Gulf. There's nothing we, we need uh, in the Persian Gulf and uh, our oil is long ago doesn't come up from, from that area. And uh, on the, in, in contrast, the Iranians to be what they want, or what they strategically aspire, they have to uh, maintain activities in the Mediterranean uh, in order to be uh, effective in supporting their allies and, and their overall strategic vision. So that's a very long voyage. Assuming uh, that uh, out of the uh, Strait of Hormuz, you have something like 500 nautical miles on the jaw of the Arab Peninsula up to uh, uh, Bab el Mande, and then another additional thousand, something like thousand nautical miles up to the Jubail Strait. Uh, the entering of the uh, Red Sea via the Suez Canal. And once they're out of the Suez Canal, uh, they still have some 300 miles to uh, Ladakia or, or Tartus, uh, sailing just in front of the Israeli shoreline. So that's a very long, long voyage uh, with uh, lots of exposure. Uh, and, and therefore, I think uh, basically uh, the only reason for them to take the risks uh, is that this is a way to uh, uh, go uh, around the oil embargo and sell uh, oil, bring oil to the Banyas refinery in Syria, where uh, the proceeds probably goes part for the Syrian government, but mostly for the uh, revolutionary guards and finance their uh, establishment there, uh, funding whatever they, they need to fund. Um, so the, the real, the, what I call the sideshow, probably the, the show underneath the water was uh, a matching between or match between uh, their uh, desire to bring oil tankers to Syria and our desire to uh, prevent them from uh, dislodging. And that uh, mainly, I think, as far as strictly conflict between or clashes, uh, the paintball clashes between uh, Israeli forces, Navy forces, and Iranian uh, vessels uh, took, took, uh, took place because uh, the last 
several years, uh, uh, most of the uh, incident uh, that came out to the public were some strange malfunctions uh, in uh, a number of uh, Iranian tankers that were trying to reach Banyas. Uh, <clears throat> it, it never really uh, came into something that is more in the open. Um, and this is a, it's a, the imagination season. Because the uh, the tricks and the um, you know the uh, clandestine efforts, uh, both to know who is selling where and what for, and what they're trying to do, and uh, the infrastructure that enables them to do uh, to sell the oil. All these uh, elements were uh, part of the. Um, part of, of this cat and mouse uh, sessions that, that is taking place in the last years. Uh, but this is as much as you can say about it. Uh, I don't think there's more uh, more of some, what you've been, people were talking about are much more serious problems. When it comes to hitting Israeli ships and uh, Israeli owned ships in the, in the Arab uh, uh, Gulf, uh, and the, the Indian Ocean. Do, do you think this is uh, something that can become some competing problem that uh, really can cause? Not really. Not re this, these ships are, are car containers. These are big uh, sailing hotels full of uh, just, uh, uh, you know, just full of, of, of new cars from Japan and, and Korea. Okay, so just helping us to uh, reduce the congestion in our <laughs> streets. I mean, there's nothing. And and as a matter of fact, the matter of, yeah, I know it's it's insulting, huh? Because there is that that ship belongs to a company that is controlled by an Israeli businessman. But that's that's ridiculous, you know. It's, if you compare this to what uh, they are suffering. Um, it's just, uh, there's no way of comparing. And, and for us, this is really, a, uh, it's not a threat. So uh, at least as far as the, as the maritime arena is concerned, the Iranians are so much limited in what they can do that I don't think uh, the panel should spend any more time about it? Okay, that's uh, for for change. We hear we hear something positive. It's uh, well, well, no. I mean, I mean, this is a uh, look. The Israeli Navy is operating all over the Red Sea freely. It's operating in the Mediterranean. They have to their their camel their oil camels have to go through such a long caravan uh, in order to get to, uh, to to Syria. And then all of a sudden they cannot unload because of the infrastructure is damaged and, and, and so on and so forth. It's a, uh, well, I, I think they, they still try, try to do it. If they remove the uh, oil embargo, probably this will be uh, one of their main targets, but uh, by and large, this is a, uh, it's not the way, it, this is not the arena where the Iranians are winning. Okay, I'm happy to, to hear about the capabilities of Israel in the Red Sea, because when you and I together were uh, hovering over the Red Sea in a small airplane and uh, in the midst of an operation there, this was not the case and this was like opening. Don't be nostalgic, but nostalgia <laughs> is not a, it's not a <laughs> business plan. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, thank you very much then, uh, Didi, and uh, I, I would say that to, to conclude this uh, uh, seminar is that uh, we are in the midst of, uh, in, in the main show, not in the side shows, as you call it, in the main show we are approaching a decisive moment where the, uh, first of all, 
the Americans have to decide what do they do about Iran. We all have the opinion that the Iranians are not going to show any flexibility anytime soon. So it's up to the Americans to decide what to do about it. This may cause some tension between the Americans and Israel. It's, it's a question mark whether the elections are in Iran are going to make any difference. If at all, uh, it's, uh, well, it's, uh, we have split opinions about that with Javad thinking that uh, if the uh, uh, radicals, I call them, and the military people, as uh, he calls them, uh, take control of the presidency, uh, then uh, it's going to be for the better. I think it's going to make the discussions even more complicated because the ability of the Americans to uh, move forward is going to be more limited. And uh, maybe it's good, but uh, this is where, where we might go. And uh, eventually, we are, we are, and uh, we and the uh, uh, Americans are going to end up in uh, in some sort of, uh, let's say, disagreement, approaching uh, conflict uh, when it comes to Iran. Because for Israel, the situation regarding the nuclear power, nuclear issue, is is critical, and uh, we, even though we. Uh, understand how important our relations with the United States are for our national security, uh, we still have to make sure that Iran doesn't have the capability to produce nuclear weapons, not today, not in the short term, not in the medium term, and hopefully not in the long term as well, uh, which uh, Javad thinks that's going to be difficult to prevent. Dori, you want to say a few words in the- Well, actually, I have a question center. for our Israeli Admiral. Um, I understand that we are now focused on the movement of uh, cars from uh, Korea and Japan to uh, Israel, which is a, an issue. Um, but one of the things I was aware of, and I'm sure he is aware of, is the um, use of the use of the Red Sea. I don't want to get into too many details. Mediterranean for resupplying our terror adversaries. And uh, of course, you know, um, Sudan was an important conduit for uh, reaching Hamas. I won't go into all the details, but it seems that um, Iran has a problem. Iran wants to supply its various uh, supporters and um, it has been seeking a, a, a land route for doing that through uh, Iraq and Syria. Well, another alternative route is the naval route. And the naval route creates a burden on our naval forces to try and stop it. So do you have any comment or you think that's not really relevant and it's not important? No, no, that, that's very important and very relevant. Uh, but uh, I, this is, Basically, I was focusing on the straight, so to speak, what I call the paintball clash between Iran and Israel on the on the on the seas. Uh, as far as uh, <clears throat> supporting terrorism, that's um, that's an activity that the Israeli Navy is involved in for years now, uh, and I think uh, one of the you know, more publicized event was the Karin A uh, ship that, that was, I think Cooper was talking about that, uh, the uh, capture of uh, Iranian made uh, weaponry for Arafat. Uh, but uh, apart from this, uh, there is a continuous, operations of uh, um, targeting. First, first of course, uh, it's intelligence and then targeting every, or most of the, of the uh, um, <clears throat> attempt to move weaponry uh, either from the Red Sea or even from the Mediterranean. Uh, we just heard about uh, uh, some other incident and then the ship that uh, one of its container was, was hit. And uh, um, 
most of it uh, doesn't even come into uh, into the public. Uh, so that's that's a uh, a continuous. Let me put it this way: the um, forces, the navy forces that are now situated in a lot. Uh, contain one of the main, for, main main units of the Israeli Navy. And this is not an incident. It, it even had a submarine there. So uh, the, uh, the capabilities uh, right now of uh, thwarting any attempt to move uh, anything that is harmful to us uh, through the Red Sea, uh, is I, I think by the Iranian standard are the last options. Uh, okay. I think the, the impact the impact of what we've done in the last six seven years in that area is uh, is so so effective that uh, it's not it's I mean there's a reason why they, they really prefer the the ground routes. Uh, they, it's just through the net, through the, the sea, it's much more difficult, 10 times more difficult. So yeah, in that thing, like the Navy is very effective. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll put uh, with this uh, positive and optimistic note, uh, this uh, seminar to, uh, to an end. would like to thank everybody, to thank Tissam, El Ketbi and uh, Dory and uh, all the other speakers for their contribution. I think it was very interesting and uh, food for thought for everybody who's interested in the security of the Middle East, Israel, the United States, and the Gulf states. Uh, it's uh, a lot of food for thought for all of them and also the future of Iran. It's, uh, this is also very important for Javad and everybody else. And, uh, wish the best for the people of Iran from here. And hopefully, as you said, uh, Javad, that uh, better relations between Israel and Iran will be possible. And this will really solve all the other problems. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>